Hello, this is Michael Bean from Forio Business Simulations, and welcome to week two of a six-week workshop on uh, web simulation development fundamentals using Forio Simulate. Good to um, have all you back again for this week, and we're con going to continue on along um, the path that we had started last week. And we're going to be covering another hour today. We're moving into our week two, which is intermediate model building. And uh, obviously, we're moving pretty fast here. We're only doing, you know, an hour a week here and uh, covering a lot of material. So um, this week, what we're going to be discussing is locating and solving model errors, defining model scope, state functions, which are like time-based functions, is another way to say time-based functions, system dynamics, and... Uh, advanced array functions. So last week obviously we talked a bit about array functions and some and some of the fundamentals and this week we're getting into more details. And we're going to continue to use real examples. We're going to continue to use uh, Jevons um, paradox as we did last week. And as you probably expect from now, you know, because we're moving so rapidly through all of this that we only have an, you know, an hour together for each week here. Um, and this is our last week that we're going to be covering model building that you know the goal isn't to be comprehensive to cover everything that's possible in the in the course but simply to give you an, uh, enough so that you can keep learning on your own and there's lots of resources available online there's many resources are available through simulate actually which I'll kind of discuss at the end in more detail um, but uh, you know again the goal here is just to, to basically get started and I think it, it, what what will really help with this is that you'll get an understanding of what kinds of capabilities exist um, uh, to, to use going forward. And I think also enough to actually start to use them as well. It's not just a survey, but an opportunity to kind of see how the, all these things work. So like I said, we're going to continue to do Jevons Paradox. And uh, just as a reminder from last week, what, uh, what um, Jevons had said was that it's a confusion of ideas to suppose that the economical use of fuel is equivalent to diminished consumption. The very contrary is the truth. Remember from last week, I had kind of offered up some opportunities for some challenges. If you wanted to um, go through them, I, I think a couple people have done that, so that's been great. The middle one was the one that I thought we could build on for this week, which is try to include the price per kilowatt into the refrigerator size calculation. So what you might remember from this slide from last week again was that the, the way of framing Jevons paradox was that higher efficiency, higher energy efficiency results in higher energy productivity. That higher energy productivity means that the implicit price of energy is lower um, and that lower implicit price means higher demand. But if implicit price means that there is a uh, change in demand, then obviously also explicit price should result in a change in demand and a change in the type of refrigerator or freezer that you want to use. And so far in our model, we, uh, we haven't included that. So um, what, we what we want to do here is, is build that out in a little bit more detail. And just as a reminder, what I'm going to do here is flip to the model. Here's where we left off our model last week. And if I go here and I'm save this and go back to our model explorer, uh, what you can see is, you know, if uh, is this change in uh, electricity spending uh, due to let's let me go to the variable here, which is the um, price per kilowatt of electricity. So we see that changing over time. That's affecting things. That's affecting the um, the yearly spending on electricity, but it's having no impact at all on. Um, on the size of a refrigerator that we're purchasing. So that's that's the addition that we want to begin with today as the first step, um, just to kind of improve our model a little bit here. So let's go back to the model. I'm going to go back to Edit Equations. And what I want to do is uh, look here at my list here from uh, last week. And I see, you know, what I did last week was I put in something called energy efficiency ratio by appliance. And I divided the initial value for kilowatt electricity consumed per cubic foot by the current value of kilowatt electricity consumed per cubic foot, which as as we went through last week, that means that at the very beginning, because we're dividing the initial by the initial, since at the first in, in year zero, this is also the initial, we're going to get one out of that. So the starting value is always going to be equal to one. We're taking that value then and we're multiplying it by the initial size to get the average size. And it's just a simple way of calculating average average size for, for our simple model here for today. So what I really want to be able to do is look at 
um, what the yearly spending on electricity is, right? Um, so, it, because the yearly spending on electricity includes things like um, the the price of the kilowatt hours of electricity. So, I'm going to go ahead and put that in here. I'm going to put in a new a new variable that I'm going to call yearly spending ratio. Let's see if I spell it correctly. By appliance, and I'm going to make that equal to you know, essentially the same formula that I used here, but in this case what I'm going to do is use yearly spending on electricity. So I'm going to put yearly spending on electricity divided by yearly spending on electricity. And that's going to give me my um, my formula. And um, what I'm going to do then is replace the electricity efficiency ratio with this new one, which is called the yearly spending ratio. And as a consequence of that, I no longer need the electricity efficiency ratio. I'm just going to take that out. So I have roughly the same model size. So that should solve my problem, I think. I feel pretty confident about that. I'm going to go ahead and hit Save Model here. And I can see it loading, which is great. And something happened. <laughs> what happened here is I created a circularity error. Um, and what broadcast, or excuse me, what Simulate does is identify circularity errors on runtime. So um, some other tools, some desktop tools that some people might be familiar with like Vensim, I think, Stella, and so on, uh, for the most part identify circularity errors um, at the time of the model creation. Um, and uh, the way that Simulate works is it identifies circularity errors during the runtime. There's some advantages to that in that uh, there's things that you can do with your model that um, that aren't real circularity errors um, that you know, depending on how you define things, that that will that simulate will allow that um, that it wouldn't be allowed if you were calculating them on, at development time. So that's why this is done this way. And so what we're seeing here is a list of of circularity errors that came from the model. And what I can do with this is kind of scroll back and look at at what's happening with this. And you can see here that my yearly spending ratio determines average size, which determines my yearly spending on electricity, which then in turn uh, determines my yearly spending ratio. So it's this this weird circle that's happening in the same time and it has no way of figuring out what that value is. And you can see that problem right here. So yearly spending ratio affecting average size, affecting yearly spending on electricity, affecting yearly spending ratio. And there's a consequence of that. Anything that results in those values is also going to have a question mark because it has no way of figuring out what those values are. I'm sh you, Probably many of you have seen the same kind of error occur in Excel. So here's a version of our model that we just created here um, also in Excel where I just included the pieces that were relevant for creating the circularity error. And starting off here, we had the model that we ended with last week. So we see average size determined by B4 times B5, which is initial size times the electricity efficiency ratio. And uh, what I'm doing is I'm going to change that to B6, which is the yearly spending ratio. And when I do that, I get this error that says circular reference warning. One or more formulas contained in the circular reference and it sort of references it kind of the same way. It's the same three variables here that it's flagging as um, as having a circularity problem. So that's one simple test that can go on in these models to, to flag that and that's a problem that we um, need to solve as well. And by the way, um, the uh, these types of errors in model building happen all the time. If any of you have built models in the past, you'll find that this is just a part of life of building. Anything but a, a completely trivial model is going to uh, to have errors in it. And, and again, sort of reflecting back on what I said was really important step for, especially for beginning model builders is, uh, and even advanced model builders is to um, frequently test your models as you're going through it, maybe adding you know, just a couple equations at a time to detect things like this that are problems. And by the way, the sequence that we went through here is a common way that these kinds of problems evolve because you know, what happens is you, you step away from model like you know, we have for a week here, you kind of forget how everything is interconnected, you add a new equa equation and then you discover that there's a circularity problem or some other kind of problem in the model. Obviously there can be other problems besides just circularity. So we need to solve this issue for this model. And uh, the way we're going to do that um, at the beginning here is to go back to look at our yearly spending ratio. And one kind of nice thing about a time-based model, a, a tool like this that's designed for solving problems over time, is that we can use that functionality to resolve some of our issues regarding um, how um, 
regarding things like circularity. So uh, an easy way to solve this problem this week is to say, well, what we really mean is to look back that we want to look at the spending ratio from previous years instead of the current year. So instead of looking at what's happening, you know, right now, because that's that simultaneity problem, we're going to look back at the previous uh, year. And I'm going to use the previous function that I showed last week. And this equation, by the way, operates kind of the same way, where it's taking the initial yearly spending on electricity divided by yearly spending on electricity. And um, that value is uh, always going to be equal 1 in the first year. So I can say that the first value I know with certainty will always be 1. And by defining that for the first value, then I can use the previous values for subsequent years and I'm going to solve my circularity problem here. So I'm going to go ahead and do that and hit Save Model. And sure enough, by doing so, I have um, resolved my, uh, my circularity problem. And I can see um, now, too, there's some interesting behavior regarding average size that because of the addition of including the price of the kilowatt hour of electricity, that the average size of my refrigerators is no longer increasing monotonically as it did before, but it's kind of bouncing around and uh, actually decreasing over time. Um, but looking at this, actually, I want to ask the question here, um, does anything seem weird or wrong about what's happening with average size? So I was just asking the question of uh, what other things seem weird about the behavior of the system over here on the right? What, what, uh, what seems sort of strange about the, the way that uh, the average size of the refrigerator is going. Well, one other thing that I think is a little bit um, unusual is that we're changing our refrigerator size essentially every year. And uh, I don't, one of, the, we, one of the things we need to scope here is kind of think about like what, what's realistic about that? Like how um, frequently would we, would we realistically change change our refrigerator size. And that kind of gets into one of the things I wanted to cover today about sort of defining these models, and that's a, um, a model scope. And um, it really starts, there's a couple of answers, a couple of things I want to explore with this and just spend a little bit of time on today. But one of the questions is how long, uh, what length of time should a model simulate? And uh, one answer is long enough to demonstrate key, the key behavior. So here we see a key behavior, and, and here we might have refrigerator purchases over time. Of course, here they're oscillating. I guess they, ours are oscillating as well a little bit, so that doesn't matter here. But, but the point is that this is, whatever time this is, is long enough to show some interesting behavior and to get a sense for what's going on. We can see that this behavior is oscillating. We can see that it's a dampening oscillation. Um, so it's telling us a story about what's going underneath the hood. If we made the simulation um, length only to here, you know, say uh, just the point here, we might think, hey, things are looking really rosy, um, and that's it, and we're done, um, and we haven't told the whole story. If we take the simulation, we ran it out to here, we'd say, well, all that's happening is there's a kind of a an increase, and then it drops down, and and then the and then the, the the simulation is over. So we would want to at least go out to here or so to midway through this timeline to be able to see at least one full cycle of oscillation in this. And even if you have a model that isn't oscillating, what you need to do is think about situations where, you know, how long is it going to take for the major dynamics or the major behavior in the, in the simulation to play out? And as a little exercise around that, what I thought I could do is um, just uh, talk a little bit about different time frames that are appropriate for different kinds of models here. So let's uh, let's just go through some of these together and, and see what you think about this. Um, and what I'm looking for here is sort of a measure of of how long things take. So for example, I'll, you know, I'll start us off with the first one here, which is uh, restocking um, ATMs with cash. And uh, my opinion is if you think about it, a cash uh, restocking situation where you know periodically you might run out of cash if uh, if the if the ATMs aren't restocked frequently enough at other times you might have too much cash in the ATM which is a waste of money um, and you're going to be doing this probably nightly or um, over the weekend maybe every other night or something like that um, so um, I would say anywhere between 10 and 30 days would be an appropriate length of time to look at that behavior so how about something like Temperature of coffee in a coffee cup. How long would that be? Martin, what do you think? Every 15 minutes. That sounds pretty good. I was going to say something like uh, my own guess, and I was just kind of in the same boat as some, somewhere between every 10 to 120 minutes. So um, the reason you might extend it a bit longer is you want to wait for it to reach room temperature. 
you know, that it can't go below room temperature, presumably, but you're kind of starting off with being greater and there's a differential and then you're, you're marking off. So I'd say my guess is that it would take some amount of time, maybe an hour or two to reach uh, room temperature again. Uh, deforestation. Um, Matt, if you see anybody who has an opinion about that, you can let me know what they think of uh, the, the deforestation or any of the other uh, values that we're coming up with down the list here. But uh, just go ahead on your own if you like and think about what how long deforestation might take. Uh, my guess is for a, a decent model for to see some of the behavior play out, we're looking at something like 5 to 100 years, something like that, right? So it depends on how fast the deforestation is taking place, what land mass, what area we're covering, but uh, but something significant. It's not months or weeks uh, or minutes for that matter. It's something longer. Hiring salespeople at a company. Um, Todd, what do you think? Well, that's that's an interesting way of thinking about it. I mean, it could you could be looking at the full cycle of you know attrition and hires and things like that, and that would that would make it, I think, a multi-year simulation. I wasn't when I was um, putting this together. I was really just thinking about it in terms of the length of time that people take to hire. So I made it a lot shorter than that. But your answer is good too. I think that that's a that's an answer that would apply if you look at both the hiring and sort of attrition settings. But if it's just a hiring, it might be, um, you know, I was. And, and by the way, I'm sorry, I once again did not repeat the answer, but what Todd had said was five years or so because he was including attrition. Um, but I was thinking something like five, eight to eight weeks to a year or something like that. Uh, residents in a city, um, basically population of a city. Um, any answers, Matt, on that one? Um, nothing has come in yet. No problem. I'll go ahead and proceed, uh, say somewhere between five and 250 years. Five years. <laughs> All right, nice. Thank you, Matt. Someone else said five years too. Um, so uh, I said 5 to 250. The reason I said such a high range is because Jay Forster's urban dynamics model, uh, popular system dynamics model, um, was set up for 250 years. So I figured since Jay Forster is a super expert on this, I have to at least go up to his minimum, right? So it's uh, 5 to 250 years is what I had. Okay, electric vehicle sales um, came up in, uh, in the State of the Union address yesterday. Uh, and uh, any numbers there? 10? 10 years is what someone's saying. I had uh, 5 to 50 years, but 10 years is a good estimate. I think, what did, what did uh, uh, President Obama say? He said something like, a million vehicles sold by 2015. So that's a fairly short time frame. Um, iPad sales. How about iPad sales? How long for measuring that in terms of model scope? Any opinions? <laughs> one year. Okay. Uh, a colleague of mine here, Madhavi, said one year. Um, any other opinions? Three year, three months, three months. Interesting. Shorter. All right. So um, I, I had something uh, a, a little bit longer. I had put two to five years, and I was thinking about sort of the dynamics playing out. I was kind of back to what Todd had done. I was kind of thinking about the whole behavior of like you have the, right now. We're in this high growth phase, presumably. There will probably be this replacement iPad two coming out in what May or something like that. But to see sort of saturation, full saturation, it's probably going to take a few years. But definitely much shorter than vehicle sales. And finally, leading to our question for today. Today. Refrigerator sales. What's the right time frame for refrigerator sales? Any opinions from anyone out there? 12 years, 12 years is excellent. I put down 10 to 50 years um, and uh, here's sort of the answers that I had come up with on my own guessing first off on this stuff. So I was like you, I put myself in the same boat. I didn't look at any, any estimates for this. But then after we put this together, what I did was I went out and, oh, wait, I had to, sorry, I forgot one more slide. <laughs> so there's a, and these, by the way, these time frames that we're talking about here are typical time frames for um, the kinds of simulations that we're dealing with. That that you know, they're minutes, days, weeks, months, quarters, years, and sometimes decades. Um, so that's kind of the time frame that we're dealing with um, for most of the simulations that we're doing. And I'd say for the simulations that I build, and maybe it's just because of the kinds of work that we end up doing, but they tend to be on the year time frame, years and quarters and things like that. But uh, I did have one project um, a, uh, a, a few years ago that was actually on a much greater time frame than this. It was actually a 10,000 year time frame. And uh, in fact, it was too short. Um, so, but we, we still had to limit it to 10,000 years. And does anybody either online today or here in the room can, can think of what that might be, what the, uh, what the project was or what the subject matter of a 10,000 year simulation was? Anything, Matt? 
breathable air is not a bad one. That I probably could fit the same time frame, but actually it was spent nuclear fuel. So we're doing some stuff with the Idaho Nuclear Engineering Laboratories, and it was dealing with um, what to do about spent nuclear fuel as sort of a technology migration problem. And the, uh, the DOE had mandated that they come up with a 10,000 year plan, which is very interesting, which is actually um, shorter than the half-life of plutonium-239, which is a 24,000-year half-life. So, uh, um, so that was even a little bit conservative, I think, in terms of uh, time frame. Um, okay, so, uh, so, but we did have some interesting answers there regarding uh, the length of things for um, refrigerator sales, and we, we ended up with something like, I had my estimate of 10 to 50 years, someone else said 12 years, that's good. But I wanted to also frame it in another way. So. That's kind of the technical answer for how long a simulation should take. But there's another answer too, which is the use answer, which, and, and, and this is sort of a little bit of a segue into our topics for next week is what is going to engage the audience that you're working with on the simulation? And, um, and, and so, you know, I'm not going to ask us for answers for these questions here for, for, for this set of five uh, groups that I've identified, but we've built simulations for all these different groups here. And I can tell you that um, in many simulations, although the dynamics might play out over long periods of time, like for example, and let's just use a concrete example from uh, a, um, uh, an energy model that we built uh, related to uh, uh, governors uh, and governor staff, that, that model um, played out over uh, 25 years, but uh, many governors uh, limited term limits for terms of office is a maximum of eight years and because they've already served a portion of their term when we're working with them it's less than eight years so so there's a, a challenge there in terms of, uh, of things that are concerned now that doesn't mean they're not at all concerned about what happens after they leave office but it means that there's a you know a primary focus on what happens during their term and you know, the same principle exists even in situations when people don't have a limited you know sort of an expiration date in that same way you know it, uh, uh, a CEO for example of a company may be able to stay for a very long period of time but often the turnover is very high for that position and they may be expecting to stay even uh, less than eight years or maybe less than four years and so there's a trade-off here too, and it's not only about the technical length of the simulation in terms of the behavior that plays out, but it's also what's the length that matters to your audience? Um, what's the length that um, you know that they think is realistic for playing things out? And often, what that means is that it's shorter. It's a shorter length of time. So, um, so we it, when you when a simulation is very long, then it sort of feels like well, these are things that are maybe even beyond my lifespan and it's sort of difficult to comprehend and, and keep people involved and so there are some solutions to that um, but um, um, there's a, a, se a second part of scope that I wanted to cover as well in addition to the time scope which is how much detail should you model that gets into you know uh, where do you stop modeling like you know you could when you when you start thinking about a model and the details of it and even in the model that we've been building so far it you know you can sort of imagine kind of infinite extensions and scope that kind of could continue in the model uh, and uh, obviously that's impossible so um, there, there has to be some limits to it and my answer to that is that we'll discuss that in the final week of this this gets into the sort of project management and scoping issues and things like that and I want to talk a little bit about that at the at the end of this um, but for right now what I wanted to do is go back and I actually have this as a um, I found on on the web again as I did last week sort of a appliance life expectancy so how long should appliances last? I thought that was pretty neat. And in the middle here, what you can see is a number of, unfortunately we don't have freezers, but we have a number of refrigerators. And I can see side by side, top mount, and our and our um, the person who estimated 12 years is pretty good. It's like a side by side refrigerator is about about that length, a little bit, uh, or actually this is for the pretty common refrigerator, isn't it? A side by side or top mount is a typical refrigerator, so that's about about 14 years and then a, a bottom mount refrigerator which I don't quite know what a bottom mount refrigerator is the freezers, the, the freezers on the bottom okay for some reason that's longer and a single door refrigerator is the longest that's probably more like a commercial refrigerator or something a dorm room refrigerator is ridiculously short I guess they're just building it for uh, for uh, for dorm length right when it's over right that's that's basically it so um, so anyway that's what we want to incorporate into our model as well. We want to uh, um, we want to include those kinds of estimates in here. And what we want to get to in order to do that is first off adjust our time frame for our model, and then also get into 
uh, looking at how we can start to build out um, these more realistic assumptions here. So because of that time frame, I'm, I'm interested in seeing how it plays out over, I mean, the shortest time frame that I could build this model is probably 12 to 20 years, something like that. I want it, I want it to be a little bit longer than that. And ideally, in terms of the duration of the, of the capacity that we have, you know, we'd want to do at least double that. So since I've got 14 years here, I'm going to make it 30 years just to round it off into a nice number and say it's going to run from 2010 to 2040 for this simulation. Um, because I've done that, I now need to make this price behavior last longer. Remember, last time this lasted for 10 years. Um, the way I'm going to do that is just be lazy and uh, change my uh, step. This is the, the frequency that it looks up these numbers above here. And I'm going to have it do it every five years. So this will be 2010, 2015, 2020, 25, 30, 35. And I'll just keep the last number there. So that'll be fine. We'll, we'll use that for today. Um, and um, and uh, let's see. What I need to then add to the model in order to build out a little bit more about uh, uh, this behavior is, is um, some things around the um, the years to replace an appliance. So I'm going to add a new variable called years to replace appliance. And I'll make that equal to, um, let's say for a refrigerator, it's going to be 15 years. Well, let's make it 14 years because that's what was in the uh, report there, just to be accurate. And freezer, we didn't have any data on. But my best guess, um, since I'm going to guess here, is going to be a little bit longer than a refrigerator because it's open less, you know, it's probably a little bit more stable or something. So I'm going to put it three years longer. Um, then what I want to do is um, add in a variable where I want to say, well, if I want to keep track, now you think about this like, th there's lots of analogies to this. Um, is like the miles per gallon of vehicles on the road, for example, in the United States. But what we want to be able to do is track the um, the size of appliances that are removed from um, from the pool of appliances that are out there, and also the size of appliances that are being added in as they're replaced, right? So those are the two things that we want to cover here. And the the first one I'm going to add here is the size of appliances um, appliances removed by appliance. So right, it's going to be by refrigerator and by freezer. And I'm going to say that's equal to the average size divided by the years uh, to um, replace the appliance. And what's this, what, it, what this is doing is it's saying that um, the, all the refrigerators out there are going to expire um, on average every 14 years. But some of them are going to expire longer. Some of them are going to um, uh, expire shorter. So it's really an average. And so what I'm doing is kind of taking the, the, um, the average size that's out there and saying that that number is going to be expiring every year. And then likewise, what I need to do is talk about the size of new appliances that are entering um, households. And I'm going to make that by appliance again. And make that equal to the, um, th this number that's changing all the time in the simulation in this case, which is the initial um, size times the yearly spending ratio. Uh, and so that number there is the, um, the the size of new appliances, but it's not replacing all the appliances that are out there in the world. It's only the ones that are kind of flowing in um, in this next time period. So that's going to be again on average by you know replacing the the, the size of appliances removed by, by the years to replace the appliance. Okay, and then um, finally, what we want to do is look at the average size of the appliance. So actually, we have that variable already here. And what I want to do is replace this bit, which is now you know, it's changing it from year to year. It's just kind of recalculating. It's as if uh, um, re refrigerators and freezers only lasted a year and you replaced them every year. And instead, I'm going to use a state variable, our first state variable, well, not our first state variable, but a very common state variable called a stock. And what a stock does is keep track of a pool of items, like, for example, a pool of cars, a pool of people, a pool of uh, trees in a forest, for example, the amount of oil stocks that exist that are in reserve. And in this case, uh, uh, a stock or a pool of the size of, of refrigerators and freezers that exist um, within households. And I'm going to say that's equal to um, the size of um, new appliances, the new ones coming in, that's the rate of new appliances entering, minus the size of appliances removed. 
Oops, I need to put an S there. If size of appliance is removed. And then um, that's going to be the amount that it changes from year to year. And then finally, what I want to do is just say, what, what does it start off at? I'm going to say initial size. So that's the initial size of refrigerators that we had you know, from up here. OK, so that's probably, and by the way, that's the trickiest equation that we're going to be covering today. I, I, uh, I know that one's a little bit uh, of, a, of a lot to go through. But um, we can talk a little bit more about that at the end when we have some um, a little bit extra time available if you want to. But um, this is sort of an introduction to some of the system dynamics concepts. And the, the key here is really looking at um, stocks and flows. And what we're talking about is a flow of, of, uh, uh, of new appliances coming in and appliances leaving the system. Um, but another concept that we want to cover in this one as well is um, that we're not, you know, initially we're kind of looking at, well, we never really defined what audience we were talking about, what population we're talking about that it has these refrigerators. Some of you might have been thinking about a refrigerator in a single household. Some of you might have been thinking about every refrigerator in the U.S. Other people might have been thinking about uh, every refrigerator, say, in a state or something like that. So the way I'm going to frame it for today is say that what we're thinking about here and to be explicit about it is the number of households in a state say you know it could be um, state I'm in right now in California or somewhere else I'm going to say well California is a large state so I'm going to make it a little bit smaller I'll say there's five million households in this hypothetical state and then what I need to do with that is is add that to um, my um, equation here for yearly spending on electricity because before it was just yearly per household. So I now need to multiply this by the number of households in state. Um, and that's going to give me the total yearly spending on electricity by appliance and everything else should work from there. Okay, and um, if I haven't made any mistakes, um, we can see now that the model is uh, is behaving quite differently. So what we can see now is that the average size um, is still declining over time, but it's declining in kind of a smooth way. It's not changing from year to year. This is like an aggregation of all 5 million households in this state, um, and, uh, and it's continuing on. Uh, con continuing on with that and from here too what I can do is make some adjustments around um, the um, the uh, um, you know the, the, for example the length of time that people purchase if I want to I can go back here and actually you know I guess I, guess I set that up as a as a as a variable instead of a decision so let me go back and change that I can set the years to replace appliance as a I set it up as a V but I want to make it a D for decision so I can edit it And now if I go back here, I can, I can see that as an option. I can say, well, what happens, you know, if the years to replace an appliance is shorter? What if it goes down to, uh, you know, uh, 12 years or something like that? And then I can run that to end to see, you know, what kind of change that has in, in behavior of the system here. And the, the lower item here is the, uh, is the refrigerator. So, okay. Um, and this is all what we're covering here is, um, the basics of system dynamics. So uh, some people I know have asked in the past about, you know, what is system dynamics and how can I learn more about it? You know, these tools that we're using don't have to be system dynamics models. They can be pure spreadsheet models and they can also be other types of models too, stochastic models or Monte Carlo type simulations and those kinds of things. But the base of it is really around system dynamics, which is a modeling discipline that came out of MIT in the 60s. And uh, um, and the, the basic concepts in system dynamics are feedback and delays. And so uh, uh, the way to represent an example of that here is that um, the more refrigerators we have, um, the more retired refrigerators will eventually have, the more refrigerators we'll have to get rid of. But as we get rid of refrigerators, it reduces the stock of refrigerators that are out there. And so that's kind of how that's working. This is the outflow of refrigerators, but that outflow is affected by the stock of refrigerators that exist in the system, but also reduces that stock of refrigerators. And so that's why we have this sort of simple feedback loop that exists here. And in addition, the other key concept in system dynamics that I believe actually a lot of times is sort of under um, discussed because it doesn't display well, essentially, is time delays. Um, and there's a time delay in the system, and this time delay we've, we've already discussed at length, and it's, um, it's uh, uh, 14 years in this case for refrigerators. Um, so uh, that's all the time we have today to discuss system dynamics, but I wanted to point you in the direction of a couple other things that you could, 
you could look at for learning more about it. One of the um, nice things that's out there is this thing called uh, Roadmaps, and it's done by the um, uh, Creative Learning Exchange. And in here, if you're interested, you can go through some modeling exercises. A good place to start is in Roadmaps 2. There's some um, beginning modeler exercises around uh, simple population models, and it gets into stocks and flows as well. So that's a resource. A second great resource is a book by John Sturman called Business Dynamics, Systems Thinking and Modeling for a Complex World. As you can see, it's a pretty pricey book, um, but you can also get used copies for somewhere between, you know, like $75, about half price or something like that. But if you're uh, very interested, this is a great resource for uh, for going through. In addition to, this, you know, this is the sort of self-learning method. Um, in addition to, to taking uh, courses and things like that, there's some classes that are available for for system dynamics as well. Um, okay. Um, next, what I wanted to do is um, go back to our model and uh, and 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 look at what really might be happening here um, with this system here with. Um, with appliances, one of the things that disturbed me about this is when what happens really when you get rid of a refrigerator, right? What do you do with it? I mean, do you sometimes it's going to be set on the curb, but a lot of times what's going to happen is it's going to be relegated to another part of the house. In fact, in some of the things I've been reading about uh, in preparation for these workshops, this talks about that the refrigerator lifespan actually ends up being a lot longer because what happens is people put it in their basement and use it as sort of a spare refrigerator for you know, for just extra room for refrigerators. So the lifespan then tends to be a bit longer. So what I thought we could do is add another array. Um, and uh, I'm going to call this the basement refrigerator. Okay, so what's happening now is I'm saying that basement refrigerator comes in because of the... Um, the, the the original refrigerator that's in the kitchen, right? So that that's what's that's what's going on with that. And like last time, when I add another array, I need to add um, some additional elements here to describe it. So I'm going to say the basement refrigerator um, is going to have the same uh, initial kilowatts uh, consumed as the as the as the one upstairs in the in the kitchen. So I'm going to put it at 1239 too. Um, I'm going to say that uh, this this refrigerator is not sticking around the same number of years as the one upstairs. So I'm going to say it's only going to stay around for five years, and then eventually people say, okay, we got to get rid of that old thing. We're not going to keep it around any longer. Um, and then lastly, what I need to do is reset the initial size. And I thought this would be a nice opportunity for introducing the concept of um, for each loops and arrays. I mean, this is sort of an advanced topic again, but I wanted to just at least expose you to it so you had an opportunity of seeing how it works. And um, um, and then there may be opportunities for uh, for using it in your own models going, going forward here. And the idea is that you can use um, loops in, um, in equations to identify other parts of, of an existing equation that you know are um, set up as an array. So now we have, remember we have these three things. We have refrigerator, freezer, and basement refrigerator. So in order for this model to work, we need to add an additional element to it. But we always want the initial size of the basement refrigerator to be equal to the refrigerator. And the, you know, the easy way to do that is just to type it in like that. I could do it that way. But the problem then is that I have one variable that I need to remember that I always need to change these two. If I change this one and this one's different, then I have something wrong with my model and that's not very good. So it'd be better if it would automatically fix that for me. And I can actually do that in here. And the way I do it is by adding something called a for each loop. And it works, if you're familiar with programming, it works like other kinds of loops do in programming where it will loop through all the um, array elements in an array or a range and uh, um, and calculate a value for it. So what we do is we kind of identify a variable name. In this case, to keep it consistent, this is what I normally do in these models. I just use the lowercase first letter of the array range that I'm thinking about. So it would be A for appliance. And then I put the array range name in. I can put in here appliance. Um, and then um, I'll just close off that loop so I know it's complete for later like that. And then usually what I do is I indent a little bit and then I'll put the function for using it. And I want to introduce you, just use this in terms of economy of time here, to introduce another function here called lookup. And what lookup does is uh, search through the array range. Um, I should you know, briefly explain too that the way that uh, array, uh, these array ranges that are named work is it's, these are technically called enumerated ranges. 
And what that means is that there's just a number that's associated with each of these values. It's almost like elsewhere in my um, set here, I just said V refrigerator equal one, V freezer equal two, V basement refrigerator equal three. And it, those are just, you know, constants that the, um, the um, compiler is holding to uh, that are stored with those values there. So when I do this here, it's really saying, and I could do it this way if I wanted to, I could put one dot dot three. But in order to make it easier to change things later, I'll use the um, the array range name appliance. So then if I add a fourth one or a fifth or something up there at the top later, it'll automatically scale that for me. I don't have to mess with it. So uh, enumerated arranges like this here always start with uh, one and proceed from there. So it's one, two, three. Lookups always start from zero. So uh, a lookup function starts from zero and then and then looks forward over time and it does it in incremental increments. So I'm going to go ahead and do a minus one so I have zero and then do the first value which originally was 17. The second value was 20 um, and now my third value I want to make equal to the uh, first value. So I'll make it initial size a um, refrigerator and um, that will work. So th that's sort of nice, isn't it? So what happens here now is um, 17, 20, and then the third one is also 17 because it's looking back at itself in the array range a little bit earlier. And as I said, it's a little bit more of an advanced topic, but I think it's really a useful feature and the, the ability to kind of look back on other uh, array range elements in your model is something that's really powerful, especially if you're doing you're converting, say, a spreadsheet model into a, a model like this. Um, that gets used a lot in those cases. So I'm going to go ahead and save this. And again, if I didn't make mistakes, um, we should see that the uh, the model is now working. And now you can see a third line um, for average size over time. And I can see that um, my uh, my initial line is working out here quite nicely, um, and the other one is is following as well. So that's looking pretty good. Um, but I still have one last problem to solve before I'm going to be happy with this model, I think. And uh, the last problem that I have to solve with it is that um, my basement refrigerator size isn't determined by my old upstairs size. It's actually now, it's like I'm buying a basement refrigerator and replacing it every five years. I did nothing in my model to, uh, uh, to make it de depend on the upstairs refrigerator or the kitchen refrigerator. So the last change that I need to make for today to my model is to add the um, the size of old refrigerators depend on the size of the refrigerators upstairs. I'm going to use this as an opportunity to introduce uh, a yet another state function which is um, uh, called delay. So I'm going to say size of old refrigerators appliance oh no actually I don't want to say appliance here equals because this is just the one equals delay of the average size of a refrigerator. Now notice here in this case I'm referring to a specific element in the array, not the entire array. Uh, comma uh, years to replace appliance and again what I want to do is refer to the basement refrigerator. So um, now what I'm saying is that the size of an old refrigerator um, is equal to a delay of the average size of an existing refrigerator divided by the, um, the years to replace the appliance. And um, this is sort of similar to um, what you might do in a spreadsheet where um, you know you said basis on time. I want this to be equal to the refrigerator size after a certain amount of time. And since I said five years, it would be five years later. So I want this number to be equal to uh, this number out here, right, in the spreadsheet. And then I want it to follow on and then the previous values, I probably just want to make it equal to the um, the first value here. So I just probably just type that in like that. Um, and so this is sort of the spreadsheet way of representing that kind of fixed delay over time. Now, notice the difference between these two. And this is, I think, one of the powerful features of doing a model um, in um, in a tool that's um, optimized for doing models over time is that if I later decide that five years wasn't right, that it needed to be six or three or ten or whatever, I have to remember how to adjust this, that the delay time is kind of implied in here and it's complicated to change, it's hidden and it's error prone. And I've seen many uh, spreadsheets that have mistakes made because of uh, when this gets adjusted later, it doesn't get adjusted in all places. Whereas in our model, all we have to do is just change 
uh, a single value for the um, the the uh, lifespan, the years to replace a refrigerator, just change this number, and then it's going to automatically work for us. But um, this is working. That's that's basically how that's working there. And so now what I need to do is change the um, average size by appliance. And the way I'm going to do that is again use a for each loop um, for a appliance, and then I'm going to uh, close off in advance the loop and then indent this a little bit. And now I'm going to introduce a um, uh, a new statement which is I can use these um, these elements these locally defined values in other statements here so I can say if a equals and then I'm going to say the name of the thing which is the basement refrigerator um, then I want to use this value here the size of old refrigerator and this format is actually identical to the way that uh, that Excel works um, and if not, then uh, use the other one. So um, for the first two, it's going to use the existing stock formulation that I used. And for the second, uh, and for the last one, it's going to use the size of the old refrigerator. I'm going to indent that to make it clear. You can see there, there's the if statement with the two values. So if A equals basement refrigerator, use the size of old refrigerators. And if, um, if not, then use the old stock, which was going to apply to um, the kitchen and the freezers. Okay, so let's go ahead and save that, and um, let's confirm that it worked properly. Um, and what we should see now is that um, uh, with our delay, that these things are um, are matching up over time. So that this value here um, should be equal to this five years later. And I think it's easier to see that in a table. So if I look at 2020 here for the average size of the basement refrigerator, it should be equal to 2015 for the average size of a refrigerator, which it is. And then likewise, 2016 is going to be equal to 2021 for the basement and so on down the line. So that's what, it's just a strict kind of a set delay over time that this is setting up for us. Um, and, uh, and that's basically how that works. So um, what we've covered so far in, um, here are a few different types of state functions of various levels of complexity. There's some very simple ones that we've included, and, and state functions here just mean something that stores the state of a variable as time progresses in the simulation. So the simplest one we've done over the last couple of days or the um, last two workshops is the initial value, because initial is just storing the initial value for something. Uh, delay is a, actually a fairly simple one, um, and it's just looking at... Uh, um, delay over time and then it's just repeating whatever a value was for the time for the, ec the amount of time previously um, and then previous is um, really just a special case of delay it's just looking at the previous essentially like the previous column right in a uh, spreadsheet or the previous time step in the kind of model that we're building and then the most complicated one we've seen so far is the stock which is more of a system dynamics function but is actually extremely powerful um, in addition to those four, there are um, 14 others that are available as well. And um, I, I know from uh, last week from comments and things, people were interested in finding out more about that. I just wanted to show you where to find that online. If you go to the support tab by clicking on help support, then click on docs, and then click uh, below here to uh, model language reference under modeling, writing a model. What you'll see is there's a long list of different functions that are available and all the state functions are available in the category called time functions. So here you can see a cum. There's our delay function and explains its input delay time and the optional initial value if you want to use it. Um, so there's two different ways of setting that up with a little example. So those are all available and all the functions that are available within simulate are available to, um, to see there. Okay. So those are the things that I wanted to cover with um, uh, sort of introducing a, a few new intermediate and even some uh, moving into advanced concepts just so you have some familiarity with it. And uh, my belief is that you're at a point now where you know enough to keep learning on your own. Like there, the kind of model that we built actually is... Um, is as complex or more complex even than many of the models that exist on our site. And if you think about why, what do we believe when you're building games using simulation? What typical, what we really, what we really believe is that games, um, uh, are help in learning because you're learning by doing, right? So you're learning through experience. And likewise, if you want to learn modeling, um, a really good way to do it 
is to learn through experience. And we've built, you know, we, we strongly believe that. I personally strongly believe that. And I, and, and the whole design of simulators around that is to permit people to, um, to learn through, uh, through doing on their own. And the way that we've implemented that within simulate is by this, uh, Creative Commons licensed link. So, uh, what we do on our site is, you know, the way we make money off of it is by, um, having people subscribe to it and, uh, and pay for hosting. But if you're willing to share your model, share your equations and your user interface with others, then uh, we'll host it for free. And most of those models are small, which is good because those are the best models to learn from. So if you click up here, if you go to the homepage, foyo.com slash simulate, and click on Creative Commons license content, then what you'll see are all the models that are available um, that are free for you to copy um, and free for you to learn from. And I think one of the best ways to proceed with that is just to go to the Find Sims link and type in a topic that you're interested in analyzing or a topic that you're interested in learning more about. So, for example, um, I could put in uh, diffusion. And um, if I search here, I can see there are 20 models that are based on diffusion, which is a kind of technology diffusion models. There's a lot of them out there. There's over 1,200 models on the site, by the way. And like I said, the vast majority of them are, are fairly small models. So if I go now to the one I know best, which is the one I wrote, <laughs> Uh, I click on the Bass Diffusion piece, and I can see a little um, interface for it. But more interesting for where we are today, I can see the um, this technology adoption model. And if you look at it, this model is smaller than the model that we've built, right? That we've built over the last couple hours. It's a t it's a fairly small model. Look at the concepts that are used in it. It's using stock, um, probably the hardest concept we have. But everything else is just really basic here. There's not even arrays in this model, right? So this is a really nice way to start. And all you need to do from this is go to overview and click copy. And if you click that copy link, then you're going to be able to copy that into your own directory and start to uh, uh, make it your own. Like learn from it, experiment with it, you know, try out some different things, you know, edit it. You may find mistakes in it. And if you do, you probably should, you know, it'd be nice of you to uh, email the author and things like that. But, but that's basically the, the idea of the system is that it's an opportunity for, you know, learning through other, other people's examples and things like that. Um, and I, I really think that that's the, 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 the best next step. We, we've just, you know, I, I mean, in two hours, there's a limited amount we can accomplish. But I think what we, what we really wanted to get to is the, this point of being able to know where the resources are and where to point to to learn more about doing these things, you know. So, again, maybe going to the Creative Learning Exchange and getting information on um, the, um, uh, the, the, the information that they have available for um, sort of self-taught or self-progressing uh, learning about system dynamics if you want to do that. Alternatively, just looking at some of the models that are existing on this site. And by the way, there's other, there, there, there are models that use the Forio simulate language, but there are models that use other languages as well. There's Vensim and I think models um, and, and others as well that are out there that, uh, that you can use. Um, okay, so lastly here for today, what I wanted to cover was um, challenges for the coming week. And uh, um, I think uh, Matt earlier had addressed one of them as, uh, um, what do you do if the length of, t well, that's the second one actually, but I wanted to bring up this one is what do you do if the length of the time to demonstrate a key behavior in your model is greater than the time that your audience cares about? Like what kinds of things can you do about that? And we can address that later on if someone's interested, but I think that's worth thinking about. And, you know, we've come up with some solutions over the years that can help with that a little bit, but uh, it is a difficult problem and it's something that's worth considering based on what we've seen today. Secondly is, uh, change the model to assume people will only increase but never decrease the size of their appliances. So right now, um, it assumes that it goes both directions. Some people might believe that and say, well, that's plausible. If, you know, electricity prices went way up, I'd, you know, and given the fact that um, refrigerators take up 20% or so of my total electricity bill, I might go with a smaller refrigerator because I don't want to spend as much. But um, you might also assume that within a certain range that people are never going to scale down because they get used to having uh, that extra space. And then lastly, we put in this constant for population um, in the model. We said that households were 5 million and it never changed for this hypothetical state. And a nice way to begin experimenting with stocks and flows would be to change the model to account for some kind of population growth. What if the population grew by 3% per year for the next uh, 30 years as we built into the simulation. So if you're interested, those are things that you might consider experimenting with within the coming week. And if you do experiment with them and need help, you know, by all means, uh, get in touch with us either through um, the uh, forum that's online or uh, contacting us directly.
Uh, what's next? Next week, we're going to cover basic user interface design. Um, we're going to get into planning tools versus games, game variables uh, versus setup variables. We'll explain more about that. That basically is the difference between what, a, say, a faculty can do for setting up a game that creates, that everybody who plays it um, has available to them. Um, we're going to do the basics of just creating tables and graphs. Um, how do you copy results into Excel and how do you control the simulation through a user interface? And we're going to build our uni user interface on our model of Jevons Paradox. So hopefully you won't be too sick of this by the end of this workshop, but that's, uh, that's where we're going today. Lastly, um, resources that can help you going forward. Uh, we're going to email you after this presentation today a link to the presentation itself, a link to the appliance longevity data that uh, we showed you today, a link to this online roadmaps course that's provided by the Creative Learning Exchange if you're interested in going through that, and uh, a link to view and copy the model as we did last week. And as I said before, um, if you need help with your model or you have other questions, um, you know, go to uh, the help support forum here and uh, you can just post a new topic by clicking this link and then ask us a question and we'll, uh, um, we'll be sure to answer it uh, in a timely way. And that's all we have for today. I, I, um, we have a few minutes for uh, questions if we see some questions for today. And I guess we're at the point where we have no questions for today, um, which is fine. So um, we'll just uh, wrap up and look forward to talking with you all again next week about user interface design. Thanks very much.